I'm Diana Eck, and I'm here to recruit you. <laughs> to recruit you to the serious study of religion as essential equipment for the age of pluralism in which we live today. This is going to be serious, not too funny. Religious literacy is critical, not just for those of us who make a business of it, as my colleague Ali Asani and I do, and not just for those of us who think of ourselves as spiritual or religious, like our friend here, Hamza Perez, of the New Muslim Cool, but for all of us, no matter what you intend to do in life or where you intend to live. The post-secular world in which we live today is filled with the energies and currents of religious faith and turbulence and change. Why these street demonstrations in Taiwan? Why the Christian protests in India? And what was that massive Shiite pilgrimage to Karbala just 10 days ago? And what, where exactly is Karbala? Beyond the headlines, we know that the massive migration of peoples to nations and cities and neighborhoods has changed the demography of the world in which we live. Gujaratis have landmark temples in London and Houston, and Muslims break ground for new mosques with local religious leaders right here in Boston. Sikhs litigate for their right to wear a turban on the airplane or on a hard hat job. Today, that next door meeting of people of very different cultures and religious backgrounds is increasingly ubiquitous and engaging across lines of difference, even chasms of difference, the kind of engagement that I would call pluralism, is the challenge of our time, what I call the age of pluralism. And here, folks, we're really dealing with we human beings as we are now. As we've heard, it took us seven million years to get here. So how could we not mess it up? Now, we know that religious communities have created a lot of trouble, and I'm not here to argue that religion is good. We've seen the cherished symbols of religious traditions turned into the weaponry of racism, of prejudice, and violence. We've seen hotels blasted and mosques firebombed. So today, worldviews collide and whether you're religious or allergic to religion, we need to know far more about the religious energies of the world we live in than most of us do. No mosques, no minarets, they say, but that's not really likely for the future of the age of pluralism. But living with our deepest differences is really the challenge, and it's a challenge for our nations, for our cities, for our universities, for our theologies and our ethics as we wrestle with the issues of a complex world. I started taking religion seriously myself when I was your age, and our newspapers carried images of another war, the war in Vietnam, a part of the world about which I and frankly most Americans knew very, very little. But as a nation, we were at war there, and for me, the awakening came when a Vietnamese Buddhist monk, Thich Quang Duc, sat down calmly in the middle of the main intersection in Saigon, poured down gasoline over himself, entered into deep meditation, and set himself on fire in protest. This got the attention of the world, demonstrating in his own being the deep suffering caused by a war with no winners, when neither side was paying attention to the people and the human cost of this violent conflict. Now, I knew almost nothing about Asia firsthand, but I signed up for a study abroad program in India, not exactly Vietnam, but Asia nonetheless. That was the first step, the city of Benares on the Ganges, one of the great cities of the Hindus, a city where people come to die, I encountered the fires of the cremation grounds there along the riverbank. And at the same time, as we saw the fires of the cremation ground, we also could see the deep spirituality 
of the people who worshiped there. This led me to the study of India and to the study of religion and what I think is one of the most challenging tasks of the humanities, to attempt to understand someone else's faith. As we know, this encounter is now part of our world, right here in Boston, all over America. Since the 1965 Immigration Act opened the door to new immigration, the religious landscape of the US has changed. There are Hindu temples in Chicago, mosques in the cornfields of Ohio. Here in Boston, the communities I had studied in India have put down permanent roots. Hindus worship at the Sri Lakshmi Temple and a dozen other Hindu temples in this area. And refugees from that turbulent war of my college years have settled the Cambodians in Lowell and Lynn. And from Fields Corner, the tea stop, it's only a short distance to the St. Ambrose Church in the background uh, with a huge Vietnamese population or to the Vietnamese temple nearby, one of a dozen in the Boston area. So if you're interested in state or national or local government, as I'm sure many of you are, there's almost no place where issues of ethnic, cultural, and religious identity are not controversial. In the Pluralism Project, we study these controversies in our case studies initiative. What happens, for example, when a Jewish advocacy group raises questions about the leadership of that mosque? If you were Mayor Menino, what would you say at the grand opening? In a Chicago suburb, uh, not far from downtown Chicago, Palos Heights, an Islamic community tries to buy a church that has been up for sale for more than a year. But the moment they make a bid on the property, 400 people come to the city council meeting, most of them to protest. So how does the mayor handle this? What would you do? What would you say as a citizen at that meeting? The economist Jeffrey Sachs speaks of the 21st century as the urban century. For the first time in human history, most of the world's population lives in cities, he says. And he lists the challenges of the new urbanism hunger, infectious disease, pollution, all urbanized, housing, transportation, education, all on the urban agenda. But nowhere does he or do many urban theorists address the urbanization of human communities, ethnic and religious communities, the new human ecology of cities, large and small. How do we engage the project of pluralism that is so essential to our human future? How are we to understand these new and fearful contests over religious and national identity? In the post 9-11 world, we know all too well that borders are increasingly dotted lines. Powered by the engines of globalization and migration, diversity has become simply a fact of the world in which we all live today. Ours is irreversibly the age of pluralism. Pluralism is not simply diversity, however. Pluralism is engagement with that diversity. Pluralism is not simply tolerance, for that's far too thin a foundation for the diversity of our age. Pluralism requires that we know something about the people with whom we share a world, but not a worldview. And pluralism is not premised on agreement, but on relationship in a world of fragmentation and division. Studying the prospects for pluralism is the work of the Pluralism Project, and I invite you to join us. But the larger project of pluralism is the work of all of us. In the cities and nations, the businesses, the nonprofits, the schools and homes that all of us will create. That's the work of all of us. And these are the great challenges of the age of pluralism. So I invite you, as Professor uh, Malin's advice was, to veer off the path, uh, to accept the blessings of the Dalai Lama, and to engage in that larger project of pluralism on which our future depends. Thank you.